right, we're going to get started here. Uh, we've got a few more folks that may be joining us shortly, but don't want to keep everybody waiting. Uh, so I'm really excited for the group we have uh, joining us here today. My name is Mitch Stein. I'm CEO and co-founder at Pond. Um, Pond is a marketplace that pays nonprofits to find business solutions to all their problems. So uh, if you're not already on there, be sure and join. It's free and you'll also get paid for joining all these great webinars. Um, we're kicking off a new month long series today throughout March, all about March Madness. Uh, no, sadly, it's not actually about sports, <laughs> but it's all about different madness and chaos you encounter in the nonprofit space. And we're starting off today with remote, hybrid, tech in operations, all of the things that stress you out and drive your teams crazy. Um, and we could not have a better group assembled here. So I'd love to hand it over to Brian and Miko to kick off with their personal introductions. And I would just ask to share, obviously, your name and who you are. And then um, I, I, just digging a little deeper, I'd love to hear a few layers of your own identity that you find most important to you that you'd be comfortable sharing with the group. And then we can get going. Uh, Brian, would you want to go first? Yeah, I'd be happy to, Mitch. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. I'll actually start with the uh, with the identity thing first. I love that you asked. Uh, most important priorities in my life: uh, a husband and a father. Uh, just celebrated my twenty third anniversary uh, this past Sunday. Uh, super excited. Found the right life partner. Best decision of my life. I uh, have two teenage daughters and uh, talk about chaos and uh, whoo, it, it's just sort of hanging on for dear life at this point, a junior and a freshman in high school. Uh, when I am not focused on my family, uh, I am head over heels in love with what we're building at Anthem. Uh, we are a team connection and new employee onboarding platform that started about two years ago. Uh, timing being what it was, uh, we have oriented towards this accelerating move towards a remote first or globally or geographically distributed workforce. So uh, timing has been uh, quite perfect, although I certainly would not have wished this chapter in human history and the pandemic on anyone. And yet this horrible gift wrapping job that we've all experienced does have a few gifts in it and uh, super excited to chat with uh, with everyone today about that. So uh, that's a little bit about me. Awesome. Mako, could you go next? Awesome, well, thank you for having me. So I am Miko Marquette Whitlock and um, I'll start first with the identity piece. So a few things you should know about me and especially if we're gonna be spending the next, you know, uh, set of hours, set of minutes together. Um, I love salsa dancing and I believe that I make the world's best vegan chili. So if you're interested in that vegan chili recipe, Happy to share that with folks after today's conversation. Uh, in terms of what I do when I'm not making vegan chili or trying to find places to do salsa dancing or live jazz, I um, am a speaker, trainer, and coach, and also a certified mindfulness uh, teacher. And I work with change makers and change making organizations around issues related to workplace wellness and uh, specifically issues related to work life and tech life balance. My intention is to support you in living your best life while also doing the great work you're doing and saving the world, doing that even better. Amazing. Well, I was going to ask for links to resources on working remotely, but I think Vegan Chili also needs to go in our recap. So I'll be following up for that, Nico. <laughs> and Andy, if you don't mind following up, we were just asking quick intro, obviously who you are in your role, but also any layers of your identity that you find important that you could share with the group too. Sure. So hi, everyone. Good morning. Thanks for joining. And thanks, Mitch, for the invite. I'm Andy. I lead nonprofits at Notion. Uh, we essentially give 50% off of our team plan uh, to nonprofits um, in the US. And the reason we do this is that we want Notion to be ubiquitous, but we also recognize that software tools are inaccessible to everyone um aren't or aren't accessible to everyone but most especially nonprofits um who carry a lot of operational burden so we want to make sure that nonprofits have access to the tools that they need to scale and then on a personal level um my career started out in nonprofits i have worked in education uh climate and poverty in the past 10 years uh working as a youth delegate at the un uh on policy and creating the sustainable development goals and then I eventually started my own nonprofit, helping young people 
start their own social enterprises that solved a social, economic, or environmental problem. In my personal life, I'm currently training for a triathlon. Uh, and so that's been a lot of fun, uh, dedicating a lot of my work hours, uh, post-work hours to that. And then in terms of identity, um, I'm an immigrant. I moved to the U.S. when I was 17 from the Philippines. So first generation and find myself incredibly lucky to be able to work in tech now. Um, but I think as a woman of color, it's so important to have more people of color represented both in tech and in the nonprofit space. Absolutely. Well, we are so grateful to have all of you here today. Without further ado, let's definitely jump in. And I think as sort of a foundational question, uh, a lot of people after two years of the pandemic are grappling with this, like, are we in person? Are we remote? Are we hybrid? What do these terms even mean? We've been bouncing between them all for two years now. Um, Miko, I'd love to start with you on just that decision from leaders. Like, what do you take into consideration when you're making that decision of what are we? Are we hybrid? Are we remote? How do we think about it? I know that's a heavy question, but we can definitely break it apart amongst the three of you. Oh, oh all right. We might be having some tech issues for Miko. Yeah. <laughs> Brian, do you want to take that one first? Yeah, I'd be happy to. You know, I think it's it's a fascinating question, and I will be the first to admit that I don't have the answer. Uh, I think I think what we've steamed roll into in this sort of environment we're in, which I think is going to be here for a little while, is kind of the ultimate workforce personalization project, and everybody is really beginning to learn. Uh, both individuals as well as leaders and managers of how they operate best. And I think this notion in the world that most of us grew up in, the business world we grew up in, was one that really attempted to and quite successfully sort of homogenize how everything happened, right? We all commuted at the same time. We all showed up at the same time. We all went to lunch at the same time. We all went home at the same time. And while the, a lot of diversions and uh, diversity started to happen with those types of schedules in years past, I think the past two years in this chapter we've been living through really accelerated it. And so, you know, I think uh, just my personal opinion is we've all learned quite a bit about ourselves, about our colleagues, about how we operate best. And really taking advantage of that level of personalization and knowing the best hours of the day that we operate at, where we do our best work, the type of work uh, that we need to do, whether it's collaborative or individual work and where we do it. I just think we've, we've sort of shotgunned ourselves into this personalization project that is only going to grow from here. That's my personal opinion. Awesome. And Andy, how have you seen these different like work styles take place amongst the different organizations that Notion supports and how do people make that decision? I think largely it depends on the business and then the people. Um, one would be the business need. I think there are a lot of organizations that work on the ground and so they still need to be in person, especially when it's something like a volunteer organization uh, delivering foods and meals to um, the unhoused or people with that have food insecure areas. And so then they would have to kind of figure out ways to mitigate the risks there. And then on the people side, it also depends on the needs of their the, the team that they serve. So I think it, it's kind of dependent upon location and then the issues that they're solving. But what I'm seeing and that is truly inspiring is that people are figuring out ways to work together. And I think when it comes to software tools, what that builds is a sense of connective tissue among people from different teams, whether that's cr cross collaboration or with other nonprofits. So I would say it kind of largely depends on that. But what is inspiring is that people are figuring out ways to work through both in person and remote and adapting yeah. the ways in which we communicate. Yeah, and I, I meant to say this earlier, but I know we've got a number of people watching live. Please jump in, introduce yourself. Um, if you've got questions, uh, this is meant to be interactive. So if you're dealing with any of these things in real time or you're curious about how to move your team back in person effectively or, or have some hybrid quali um, component of your work, please don't be afraid to drop that into the chat. Um, and Mako, I don't know if you're you're back on or, or have audio. Um, but one thing that I would love to hear a bit about is specific to nonprofit work in making these decisions. Obviously, nonprofit is a 
total umbrella term. Um, so it, it applies to a lot of different things, but what have you seen be important in making that decision at nonprofit specifically? Yes, can you hear me okay? We can, yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, so I turn my camera off, I'm, I'm having connection issues, but uh, I, I think the biggest thing is to make sure that any decision that you're making, especially with this type of transition, um, is that it's people-centered um, and that we're not just focused on sort of the, the flashy, shiny tools of trying to focus on trends, but we're actually centering the people that we serve and we're centering the people in our organizations as part of the decision-making process. And that means um, having conversations with folks, one-on-one, -on -one, small groups, doing surveys to figure out what challenges people are facing, what do they actually need from the internal aspect of it, and then also working with your external stakeholders to figure out what they need in terms of how services are being delivered um, in this in this current um, environment. And once you have all those pieces together, then we can begin to talk about strategy and we can begin to talk about uh, appropriate tools. Many times what I see, particularly in the nonprofit sector, is that we start the other way around. We want to pick the flashy new thing and then try to shoehorn our services or our approach that way. And I think that's probably not the, the best or maybe the wisest um, way to approach this type of transition. Um, something else that I, I want to add into this conversation is that um, things have changed and we're not going back to normal. So I think one of the most powerful things that we can do is to simply acknowledge that things have changed, that we don't have all the answers, and that might what might work for us right now in this season of life and work might have to shift and change again. So acknowledging that, acknowledging that we don't have all the answers, all of those things are powerful things, including bringing your teams and your external stakeholders to the table when you're making this decision. Yeah, I love that. That you know, Brian talked about personalization, but that doesn't just mean the tools you're using. It's just in actually personalizing the feedback and and making sure you're staying in touch with people. Um, but Brian, when it comes to tools, and obviously you were building and evolving your platform right alongside everybody during the pandemic, um, what did hybrid and remote work kind of reveal in your mind about the technology needs people have, and especially for folks that maybe are a bit behind on the technology adoption curve? Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting. Um, as I reflect on the past couple of years and even a conversation like today and connecting with Andy and you and Miko and having this glimpse into people's personal lives through cameras, right? Most, most of us have had some experience over the past few years being in our homes, our apartments, our condos. And I think what's so interesting is the technology sort of opened up a view into people's lives at a level of scale that we never had before. And if we paid close attention to what was happening in the rooms of our colleagues, our clients, um, our teammates, um, I think we had this really fascinating glimpse at, uh, perhaps for the first time, at who people are, not just what they do. Mm -hmm. And I think the technology helped that. Um, I do worry, though, about uh, this uh, level of perhaps permanence that may come from being fully remote all the time. I know there's a lot of great success stories, uh, but I'm a firm believer and biased, as my opinion may be, that connection is critical. And uh, I think to Miko's point, there's a lot of great technology out there. Uh, and yet, I think we also learned through the past couple of years that there's a fundamental need in our DNA, our wiring, that we've got to connect. And if we're going to be operating in a remote or a hybrid reality and the level or consistency of connection is going to be less frequent than before, then I think what that does is increase the intentionality that leaders need to operate with for how and how often they create opportunities to do that. And I just think that's, again, I'm biased, but I think that's what's most important right now. Uh, and the data just continues to pour in, suggesting that the deeper, more meaningful connections we have with our colleagues, the better the work product is, and the better our overall happiness quotient is in our own lives. So um, I, for me, that's sort of the big reflection on, uh, on what this technology has uh, accelerated, at least from my perspective. Yeah. And Andy, you know, especially as Notion has really exploded in its adoption in the past few years over the pandemic, wh what do you think are the needs people all of a sudden realized that they had 
or or they could no longer get by without addressing with technology um, once the pandemic hit. Uh, could would you mind clarifying that a little bit more? Yeah, so I mean, I think a lot of either workflow management tools or connection tools um, are people weren't necessarily seeing the applicability or or mm -hmm. why I need, especially if I'm tech averse, like I don't want to add another tool or I don't want to use a new piece of tech. And all of a sudden, it were things that we relied upon. What do you mm -hmm. think people learned in that process, and and what are um, some of the ways people now learn to use those tools with or without remote or hybrid work? Uh, good, good question. So I would say at Notion, we had like to say um, this phrase called repetition does not spoil the prayer. Uh, and I really like that because it really, I think, centers around the need for better communication, whether that's through software tools or through um, in-person communication. But I think really the need that I, I'm also very tech averse um, and would have been one of those people that would have said, oh, I don't want to learn another tool. But I think what's great about a tool like Notion is that it's able to bring people together uh, and communicate with one another and disseminate information in, in, a, in a much more easy and accessible and also beautiful way. So for example, I think before with in-person, it was easy to just tap a colleague or two on the shoulder and be able to discuss things with them. But now that people are remote, we have to make sure that things are inclusive and that things are uh, documented so that people from other teams aren't left out. So now instead of tapping a colleague or two on the shoulder and discussing something, I have to now put it into a document, make sure that it's well thought out, um, it's easy to read, and then I'm able to share that with other members of the team so that then no one is left out. And so I think now that we are back in person at Notion, um, we still continue the same practices and, if anything, have improved our ways of communicating and disseminating information with one another. Oh, I love that. And I know Christina was just able to join. So uh, I'd love for us to get a, a quick intro. And then, Christina, I've got a, definitely a question on this topic for you, too. But if you don't mind just sharing who you are and where you're coming from today. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm so sorry. My computer was not cooperating and I had to get another one. Speaking of uh, hybrid and uh, work, um, these things happen. Um, my pronouns are she, her. I'm the chief people and equity officer of the LGBT Center um, in the West Village um, in New York City. Um, I've been here for almost four years um, and my background has been in people and HR work um, as well as DEI work in the nonprofit world. Amazing. And Christina, we were just chatting about, you know, as the pandemic hit and all of a sudden there were all these new tools we needed to adopt, but there were actually good things that came out of that, regardless of whether you're working remotely. And I think Andy brought up some really great points around accessibility and consistency and and um, and and just access for people. Where do you see that come up? Because I know the center obviously has super diverse operations and teams that all need to be aligned. How has that played out in real time as your actual status as remote or hybrid has changed and evolved many times in the past two years? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. We're a community center, so I don't think we ever would have imagined a world of remote and hybrid work uh, prior to the pandemic, right? We, we're very much a place-based space um, where the action happens here and people come here. Um, but I do think like many people have experienced and seen um, the benefits um, of introducing uh, the hybrid options and accessibility. Um, I think specifically on the program side, so right, we run a substance use clinic um, through, you know, that's licensed through the state. Um, and we had actually, we saw actually a, a climb in the number of people we were reaching and accessing for our one-on-one uh, -on -one and group substance use services. And I think there were many things driving that, right? Um, I think it's just convenience um, of just being able to kind of log in and, and get services over the course of your day, not having to come from wherever you are to the West Village to do that. Um, and I also think it's there's some, if you think about just the sensitivity around right, substance use and going through the process of recovery, like there is some anonymity of being able to do it in that way and not have to walk into a building um, um, to, to seek out, um, you know, recovery services. So we really saw, I think, I don't think anything we ever anticipated and 
um, you know, the state would have never allowed um, remote um, services in this way. So I think it's also um, forcing these uh, government agencies and um, grant makers who often um, don't move uh, at the speed in which the world moves. Um, to sort of reconsider and see the benefits of it for ultimately, um, you know, the people that we are trying to service and reach. Um, so I think it, it taken some of the red tape down that was there that we never would have been able to overcome um, prior to that. And, you know, I think on the staffing side, right, and we see this across the board, right, I think it's just, it, it has created a sense of just better work life balance for many people um, to be able, you know, we are currently working in a hybrid format, um, you know, and I think the flexibility is what people have appreciated um, uh, on the positive side of hybrid work. It does create challenges too, but I think that is one thing um, our staff have appreciated. Um, and I think it's helped to sustain them through what has been a very stressful um, two years and what continues to be a very stressful world that we're living in. Um, so yeah, I will I will end there in terms of like some of the positive things that have come. Yeah, and yeah. you know, we just had a great question come up too in the chat around, um, how do you make a safe space for people that are grappling with all of this change and adopting new technology? And there are lots of innovations and helpful things that come out of it, but I think we definitely need to emphasize patience and grace. Miko, I know you coach people on this. I'd love to hear you dig in a little deeper on Brian's question here. Sure, so can you reframe the, okay, so we're talking about the comment here. Yeah, so I, I, I agree with that and, and I will just emphasize what I talked about earlier, which is when we're, especially when we're talking about technology, making sure that it's people centered, right? And remembering that people create the technology and people are using the technology and that there is someone else on the other side of that screen. And when we are able to remember that and center that, it's not that the technology is taking over, is that we have an opportunity to be intentional and thoughtful about how we are employing the technology. And that the way in which we're employing it is not getting us to where we want to go, getting us to the outcomes that we want to see, then we need to take a step back and think about what is our intention and is there a different way that we can use the technology or is there a different way that um, we can, you know, sort of reframe our, our use or should we be using a different set of, set of tools? And so I think that's critically important. Um, I'll also emphasize the, what I talked about earlier, which is simply acknowledging that we are figuring this out in many ways, you know, there is, and there is no one size fits all um, solution or answer. And so what might work for you and your organization right now, this particular point in time might not be what works for another organization or, um, at, at, and, and so, and that's okay, right? So it's not, we're not comparing each other. We're not competing. Um, there is no judgment there. It's about all about finding about um, what works for you in this particular moment and being okay with that, that might change um, down the road. Yeah, and, and I feel like we've talked a lot about the accessibility and innovation that these things lead to, but you also have to acknowledge that sometimes tech usage can detract from things or there's, it's not always a solution. Brian, where have you seen this and, and how can that be spotted and addressed where you're having negative effects of increased technology usage on your team? I mean, I definitely think uh, you raise a great concern when technology starts to become a surrogate for real human connection. And that is something that I think we all need to be very tuned into. Uh, you know, the comment that uh, one of our guests, Brian Shoemaker, just made, uh, you can just sense from the comment uh, about this, um, his approach to leadership, right? And this leaning into, as he calls it, patience and grace. And I think that that is... Like, I just think there's such a huge opportunity for leaders, regardless of level within the organization, for them to really lean into taking care of people. And Miko has said it a number of times where all of these decisions need to be people centric. And, you know, whether it's using technology for synchronous work or asynchronous work, um, you know, technology there to enable efficiency, effectiveness, and it's all great. I, I love my technology tools. And yet at the end of the day, it is the people who use the technology that make the things happen, whatever those things happen to be, whether it's in the for-profit space, the nonprofit space, the government space, um, 
you know, it, it is all about people. And so I think we just need to keep a really, really close eye on our adoption of technology and our reliance on it to do things that I think we need to um, always uh, take advantage of our humanness. Uh, so that's just a, a big focal point for me. Yeah, and, and Andy, you mentioned a little bit earlier about some of the benefits of these tools um, in that things are more transparent and you actually do a better job of documenting and, and bringing people in to conversations that otherwise might not have had, had access. But there are definitely still opportunities to create some bias or reinforce power dynamics if people don't have the right access or aren't looking at the right things. Could you maybe talk a little bit about where you see that come up, like where you see power dynamics reinforced or bias reinforced and how that can be avoided in the use of hybrid and remote work technology? For sure. So I just actually had a talk with a nonprofit that works on increasing access for of internet access to marginalized communities. And I think where sometimes we forget at work is that not everyone comes from the same socioeconomic background um, with the people that we work with. And so sometimes people may have better access to internet. Um, sometimes people may struggle with that. Sometimes it comes down to even not having the proper room to create an office space. Um, let's say someone lives in a one bedroom or a studio with other people um, or kids. And so we have to factor in things like working parents whose daycare has to close because there's a COVID outbreak, which has definitely happened to my brother-in-law. What then happens when they don't have, uh, when they don't, when they can't afford extra childcare. Um, and so there's grace and patience, but I think there's also a sense of humor that is very important in these spaces to remember that at the end of the day, our colleagues are human and they have personal lives, which may not be considered, I think, professional, quote unquote, uh, typically um, previously or at least pre-pandemic. But now I think it's become more normal. And I think if anything, it deepens our human connections when we're able to see uh, the more personal aspects of our colleagues' lives. Uh, so, yes, apart from grace and patience, I think it, it it helps to have a little bit of humor when we're dealing with these things. And then in terms of power dynamics or potential bias, I think this is a little bit more complex, but it always comes from the top, right? Uh, culture comes from the top. You can have people fighting, let's say, for more equity if they're um, individual contributors. At the end of the day, if your leadership isn't showing some sense of humility or some sense of grace and patience, then uh, then I think that's definitely a conversation that needs to be had within the organization on how we want to relate with one another as we are going through something as um, as complex as a pandemic. Yeah, and and I. I, I just love the examples you gave to really concrete. And I think somewhere where we've all been, I mean, heck on this, on this webinar, we've had some tech issues started late had some video issues. Like it just happens. And I think we've all grown a lot from really just blowing up with that word professional. Like what does that even mean to be professional? Um, and, and Christina, I'd love to hear from you a bit, especially from your, all of your deep DEI work of like, how has that brought DEI issues to the surface in a lot of cases when you're remote or in people's personal lives. Um, how have you been able to engage with that productively? Um, and I'd just love to hear a bit from the ground of, of how that's been on the front lines of this work. Yeah, I mean, so I think one thing that's very, you know, unique to this, the work we do and the services that we create, um, you know, I think it is having a space um, that you can work in. But for many of our uh, clients um, and community members that come get services from us, um, people that they are around or live with may not know that their identity, right? Or may, they may be figuring out their identity. They may not be out publicly. They may not feel live in environments where it is safe um, to articulate and express, or maybe they're still in that stage of discovering it. So I think it's just a consideration as we, you know, think about reaching people and that idea of accessibility um, that has been unique for us. So one of the hardest communities for us to reach in the virtual world is youth um, uh, for that reason. You know, we our services and access to youth 
um, you know, throughout the pandemic in the hybrid space has been a real, real, real challenge. And it is for those reasons that I listed. So I think um, just as we think of the many things that could range from like socioeconomic, um, like what people's identities are, these are all things to consider in how we can reach people in this virtual space. Um, you know, in an authentic and helpful way, um, which is why I think, you know, the option of in-person services had to come back for us um, because not everyone has access to technology or internet consistent, you know, reliable internet or a safe space to have uh, very deep and personal conversations. Um, so um, that's just something we've definitely been very sensitive to. And I do agree with um, just Andy's points. I do think it has been an opportunity uh, to make us all more human, right? Being in people's homes, right? Normally, I think we've lived with this slight divide of we had work and we had home and they were like these two discrete places. And granted, people did work remotely prior to the pandemic, um, but not in this way. So I think it has um, made people more human humanistic, um, and we see the humanity in people, whether that is your kids in the background, a partner, whether or not people live with someone. Like, we didn't know all of these things um, prior uh, to the pandemic. Um, and so I think not making assumptions is the key thing as you're, uh, um, like, creating these hybrid or maybe fully remote um, uh work environments, I think is key um, as you think about applying like an equity lens to this work and um, really talking to the, if you're, if you're, you know, whether that is your employees, whether that is like communities you're trying to serve, like really talking to them to find out what their needs were. That's what we had to do early in the pandemic was just like, I mean, we, we were forced, you know, on a Friday, we were done March 13th and by Monday, we were operating a virtual community center, which we had never done before. And so we really had to go to staff and say, what are the obstacles to, to working in this way? So I just encourage, like, um, instead of trying to come up with, like, top-down strategies on, like, figuring it out, really think of going bottom-up and going um, to the people you're either working with or trying to reach to to really ask what they need and then finding solutions to figure out if it can work in this way. Because I think that will be the question for us as we continue on this journey is, is this working? Where is it working? Where isn't it working? Um, and making adjustments. And Mitch, yeah, if and I can, can I jump please, in real quick? I just, I, I want to comment, uh, both Andy and Christina um, have been just circling this topic. Um, I think it was September of last year, uh, McKinsey released uh, kind of a mini white paper, and it was a deep dive into this great resignation label that's been flying around in the some 33 or 35 million people who have voluntarily left their jobs since May of last year. And what their research uh, showed was the delta between what employers thought were the reasons that were leading to this mass exodus versus what all of us as employees uh, were truly saying. And at the end of the day, what the top reasons, <clears throat> excuse me, that the employees were sharing was all around the sense of how we feel. I don't feel valued by the organization. I don't feel like my voice is being heard. And I actually don't have trusting and caring teammates. And so it wasn't pay. It wasn't perks. It wasn't uh, upward mobility. And I'm not suggesting that those things aren't critical. They absolutely are. But I think they've become such sort of minimum table stakes for so many people that now we've sort of ushered into this somewhat unexplored territory for a lot of company leaders of how we feel. And if we don't feel like we're uh, being valued or our voice is being heard, or we don't feel that we have that deeper level of trust in the people that we work with, not the competency-based trust, not that, hey, I know that I can rely on Nico to do his job because he's great at it. That's great. We need that level of trust. But what if a meeting's going on and I'm worried because I'm not in it, is Miko, and I'm not trying to pick on Miko, but is he going to attempt to advance his career because I screwed something up and I'm not in the meeting to defend myself? Is he going to use my absence to his advantage? And I think there's all of these dynamics that are at play right now that the light is very... It, it, the spotlight's on it, and yet uh, company leadership is still stuck in a far more transactional mindset of how to fix it 
And it's not that. It's a relational world that we're in right now. And I think I'm excited and annoyed all at the same time that we're finally here. And like we get to explore this landscape of how we feel. And let's let more empathy and compassion and love and not romantic love, but companionate love into the workplace. We spend the majority of our life here. Like, here we are. Let's take advantage of it. Um, I get excited about it. And Andy and Christina were, were chatting about it. So I, I felt compelled to jump in. Sorry for my tirade. <laughs> no, I, it's really, really helpful. And I, I know, Miko, you do talk about mindset a lot for people in these settings. Um, and I'd love to just hear if you've got any any kind of response to the things Brian is bringing up and and how to actualize that mindset shift, especially for leaders in the remote and hybrid setting. Yeah, you know, one of the one of my favorite um, proverbs that I've been really using to frame conversations I've been having with teams is a Haitian proverb that talks about the fact that mountain after mountain there will be more mountains. And for me, what I take from that is that our life and our work is never challenge free, that we're always gonna have challenges that we're encountering. And so the work that we all do, and the work that I do with teams in terms of workplace wellness is to build your strength, right? To help you get stronger, to help you build your muscles so that you get stronger in building those mountains and navigating those changes, whatever they are. One of the things that we know right now with the current transition that we're in is that none of us has the answers, right? If someone's telling you they have it all figured out, that they have all the answers, I suspect they might not be telling you the, the whole truth. Um, and so, um, and, and in a weird way, one of the ways that you can give people a sense of certainty and a sense of control over their circumstance is to simply acknowledge that, right? To acknowledge, here's what we know, here's what we can do, here's what we don't know, but our commitment to you is that we're gonna figure this out together. Um, and I think that's one of the more powerful mindset shifts that we can um, really help um, people. And I, I think if leaders can acknowledge it, can model that type of vulnerability, um, it, it has a cascading effect across um, the team. And you get to a place to what Brian was talking about, where we're actually more empathetic and we're actually more compassionate. And so when we talk about the future of work and what this looks like, you know, more explicit conversations and even skill building about what does compassion and empathy actually look like in this um, environment? Uh, what does it look like in terms of extending grace? What does flexibility look like? All of those things I think are going to be embedded in what we're looking at moving forward. And to Brian's point, um, people aren't just looking at the perks and you know the title and how much money they can make, but they're looking at how do I actually feel when I show up in this place, right? And I think that's been a, because the pandemic has forced many of us to really think about that perhaps in a way that we hadn't thought about before. And I want to and go I on think, record and say that uh, Miko would never attempt to advance his own career at my expense if I weren't in the room. I was just, uh, just an example. You know, I think part of the reason that in that study you brought up, Brian, and why that's come to the surface for so many people is we've historically always talked about work-life balance. And once you're working in a remote fashion, it's now blurred together. And so that's why you it's a lot harder to separate, oh, it's just work. So then in my outside of work life, that's where I feel belonging, connection, value. Uh, value. Um, and now that's blurred and, and you can't separate it. So another question came up um, from the group about that concept of work-life balance and how tech now enters the scene and remote work enters the scene. Um, should the goal be balance? Should the goal be like a fruitful integration of the two? Um, I know all of you have great things to say on this. So if someone wants to go first, I'm sure everyone can chime in. I'm, I'm have, it's interesting. Um, I think one of the biggest lessons we've learned around this journey is like, um, there's just not a one size fits all approach. Right. And I think, um, What's interesting, right, is there people like me that's like, no, I need I I need the physical separation. Part of it is I have two young kids. We live in an apartment. We just don't have space. Like, I need it. So I come into work mostly. I don't have to, but I am here four to five days a week. Um, and then on the other hand, there are people, and that's how I create it for myself, among doing other things like turning the alerts off my email, um, actually closing my computer on the days that I work from home. So, like, just 
simple things that make sure I don't go back and just sit there. Um, but I think there are other people, right, who are like, actually coming into work is more stressful to me. The, the time to commute, the I'm more efficient, you know, being at home. And I, I like maybe having a large chunk of time in the morning and then I break and then I'm working into the evening, but I'm structuring my day a little bit different, right? Like it's not the traditional maybe like in our workplace for some people allows it, for other people it does not. Um, so I think um, everyone has struggled with it, but I've learned that I can't find a solution for everyone. Um, but I think offering this space to talk about it is what's important because I think I can learn something from someone. I'm like, oh, that strategy sounds interesting to me. But I think what I've had to learn in particular, like in a people role going through this is that I actually can't find the solutions because everyone needs something different. Um, and that's just been to me like the greatest lesson of going through, you know, A, the pandemic, but um, B, just this transition into working in a way we've never worked before. I, I absolutely agree with that. And I would extend that to say that um, it it ebbs and flows with the seasons of our life, right? And so what's working for you right now um, may need to be different in a different season of your life. So if you just had a newborn baby, for example, um, that's going to require a different type of, you know, quote unquote balance, for example, in terms of what that looks like for you, than it might in a, diff a different season of your life. And the the, the next point I want to make tied to this is that it's an ongoing process, right? It's not a one time flip of the switch and we're like, oh, I arrived. I'm finally balanced and fully integrated and whole. It's like, well, no, it's an ongoing process that we are constantly uh, engaged in. And so when we can understand it from that perspective, I think it helps us to, to really pace ourselves. And one practical thing that I recommend for folks, um, whether you are remote, you're working in person or you're doing a little bit of both, it's to be intentional about carving out our start and a stop routine for your day because everything can be so blurred together. Um, you know, starting with a little, as little as five minutes that before you dive into work, before you open up your email, before you um, are you know responding to text messages, having something that you do to pour into yourself before you get ready to pour into the world can be very powerful. And then making sure that at the end of your day, you have something that's very similar um, that really either marks like a, a break. Um, maybe you're shifting into the, the next shift of your work, or maybe you're shifting more fully into spending more time with your family, whatever it looks like for you, making sure that you're being intentional about at least building in two of those throughout your day, at least starting with at least five minutes. If you have more time, that's great. Um, but I think a great starting point for most folks is five minutes if you feel like you just don't have the time. Um, on a more tactical level, I think uh, it comes down to setting boundaries. Zoom fatigue is very real. And so I will have days where I just don't want to do Zoom meetings at all, usually Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, and then I'll schedule time for deep work in order to essentially make sure that people can't book time with me unless it's an absolute emergency. And then one thing that has been helpful, again, coming from leadership or culture comes down from the top is also seeing leadership set blocks on their calendar making sure everyone knows that you know they're busy from 5 to 7 p.m they're on kid duty or it's family time and they'll actually put it on their calendars um, and have it say family time and so it's really inspiring to see someone lead from that way and really make sure that people know that they have other priorities other than work. And yes, work is important, but at the end of the day, we do our best work when we're happy and healthy and balanced. Um, another thing when it comes to mental health is just knowing what you need and being able to communicate that with your manager or leadership and also trusting that they will make the space for that. Um, on the leadership side, there's also a ton of other benefits people can offer, like more mental health benefits, let's say more cash for FSA or HSA in order for people to be able to afford therapy. And so there's also accessibility when it comes to mental health that I think uh, companies can focus on. Yeah, I think it's it, uh, tough going last after uh, all three uh, shared such such great insight. Um, I, the word that comes to mind for me is just transparency and what works best for you and just being honest about it, whether you're the leader 
uh, or you're a member of the team, just letting folks know what works best for you. Um, I think I'll add on a tactical level. Um, I've had plenty of colleagues, including myself, like I do some of my best work at nighttime. I'll be laying in bed, I have the laptop open and I'll, I, I just get in the zone and I start cranking. And I have to realize that if I start firing off emails, whether it's to clients or colleagues, that based on where I might sit in the hierarchy, especially if I'm sending an email to a member of my team that I have the responsibility and the honor and privilege to lead and they get it, they might feel that they have to respond at nine o'clock. So I think there's some really simple things that we can all do in talking about, hey, uh, if I send you an email at nine o'clock, I don't, you don't need to respond. I'm just in the zone and I want to get it out. And so it's fresh, it's top of mind, and this is how I'm working best. You respond when you can. Uh, or you can just stick it in your drafts box and then fire it off first thing in the morning. So, you know, I think there's a number of just little tiny tweaks that we can all make, but I think it's all predicated on just being open and transparent about what works best for you. And uh, I think that's just sort of a uh, putting a period on the boundary setting uh, piece that's been talked about. If I could, I, I would like to extend what Brian was talking about in terms of the tactical piece with the email. So this is one of the things I talk with a lot of teams and organizations about, which is that um, it actually creates a lot of background stress for folks, right? So either they choose to respond to the email that you sent after hours, or if you say you don't need a response, they still, they're still carrying that stress with them until the next day. And so one of the recommendations I have for folks is that there are many tools for Outlook, for Gmail and other systems where you can pre-schedule emails to go out at a specific time. You can leave it in your drafts. Um, you can delay send. There, there are lots of different options. So my, my go-to is that if it's something that doesn't require an urgent or immediate response, pre-schedule it or have it just go out later. Because even if you send it and with the caveat that, oh, well, don't, you don't have to respond. People still feel like they have to respond in order to be seen as responsive or, or diligent just based on their personality. So just being mindful of the background stress that that can create unintentionally. Can I just try? I just want to just echo that we and I think the positional piece is really important, but also functional. So um, I actually asked our senior leadership team and as, as well as HR to do that. We use scheduling feature all the time if it's past a certain hour or the weekend, because um, I agree if people see it, they feel obligated if it's coming from someone that they perceive has more positional power. Yeah, another tactical advice uh, piece of advice I'd give is to follow Miko's Instagram, which is Mindful Techie, because I can't tell you the number of times I've been scrolling and hit his story and it's just like, stop using Instagram. <laughs> And I'm like, oh yeah, I've been doing this for 15 minutes. I need to get out of here. Uh, but I do, and I, I joke, but I seriously think having some like reminders to yourself, whether those are like blocks on your phone for like a certain amount of time, you use different tools that you know can really suck you in, um, and actually listening to them or and discussing that with your team or you know people in your life, uh, I do think is, is really helpful because sometimes there can also almost be like a little bit of shame wrapped up in these things where you won't, don't even want to talk about it with other people if you feel like you're doing, you know something's bad, but you're kind of getting sucked into it. I mean, that's talking about mental health. There's a ton of shame associated with, with mental health, especially in the workplace, um, which I think leaders and everyone can do a better job to alleviate by just being more transparent, being more vulnerable, being open about it. So there's, make a, it, thank you really for that. Good, there's a really good question in the chat on the concept of re-onboarding people as we head into a hybrid model. One thing that I love about um, how Notion has approached it is that we created a, doc, a communications guideline document, essentially making sure that people are aware of position, things like positionality and the ways in which we communicate over the course of um, the beginning of the pandemic, there were leaders that hosted uh, talks on nonviolent communication. Um, we've had feedback training that focuses on situation, behavior, and impact, and then essentially gave everyone the training on how to give and receive proper feedback. And then in the communications document, we also have rules in terms of when we communicate and how we communicate. So, for example, I've never received a Slack or email throughout the weekend. Um, and typically never past anything past 5 to 6 p.m. And I find that this is incredibly important when we set these boundaries and everyone commits to it. It's incredibly important to 
um, set that culture within the organization that we respect each other's personal lives. Yeah, thank you so much for calling that out, Andy. And there was another um, question a little bit ago in the chat about video and interviewing. And I think it's similar to onboarding, but I think it's how you interact with people that could be a part of your company. And there's a lot of equity and accessibility considerations around new hire, how you interact with people in, in the interview process. Um, I don't know if anyone has a view on how to make sure your interview processes and the technology you're using are accessible and equitable um, and any best practices there. Christina, I don't know if you've got any tips for folks. Um, yeah, I mean, we, for, I don't have a ton of tips here because I think this is still an area we are figuring out and also uh, where we are bringing back interviews in person. Um, uh, we haven't really made a decision. Still, a lot of our interviews are in the virtual world. Um, but we do, you know, we do ask um, if anyone has issues, um, you know, accessing Zoom, which we just haven't come across it just because at this point, most people are, you know, that we are, have been interviewing are working in this way um, for similar organizations. So even if you know, personally, they may not have things, they have it for work. But I do, I mean, I do think it's an important consideration and something to consider, um, you know, just even the options of how people interview. Um, because a lot of, you know, I think fatigue is real. I think um, in, in this video format, I think a lot of people are just like extremely nervous. Um, so just thinking about like, who is in an interviews, how many people are in interviews, how it feels. I think what we really do in the beginning of interviews is we do a lot of like setting up of our interviews. We, um, you know, do we do like check in questions a lot, which are basically uh, often like just icebreaker type situations to kind of like humanize all of us on the interview. We do a lot of like we are working uh, like the technology may fail because people are so stressed, like they're so stressed as it is coming into the interview. And then they're so stressed, like something may happen with the technology. And we just acknowledge a lot of that stuff. Like we put it up front, like something may happen with Zoom, it may click off, it may, you know, your mic may not work, or someone may walk through your background or a doorbell may ring. And we're just like, it's okay. We'll, we'll we're just going to keep going. Um, you know, we do a lot of acknowledging, like we use two screens. So I'm like, you may see me looking over. This is where I have my notes and your resume. So we just do a lot of that like context setting, I think, to help bring down some of the anxiety that I think interviewing in a virtual platform creates. Because I, for me, I'm challenged. Like it's some, I get challenged talking to people I know sometimes. But to do this with people you don't know is really challenging. And at least in a human in-person interaction, you can have like small chat. And so we try as much as possible to create that. Um, I know people are still nervous, but we just kind of acknowledge the awkwardness of, of the situation. Yes, I, I think that power of acknowledgement is, is very powerful. And something else I would add to this that I would do even pre-COVID is that the, the first initial screen before you move to the next part of the process was always a phone conversation, a one-on-one -on -one phone conversation. So um, I think that could be a great way to start the process um, so the people build that rapport, they build that familiarity, and hopefully by the time they get to the place where maybe you have, you know, two or three people on on Zoom at one time, that it's a uh, they're they're in a better place, and you know you're able to calm some of those nerves and address some of those um, issues before they get to that phase. Yeah, no, I think those those are super helpful tips. I love the the kind of setting, acknowledging where people's emotional state might be and just like make that comfortable for everyone. Um, we just have a few minutes left. So I'd love to go kind of around the horn before we wrap up. And you know, these topics aren't necessarily nonprofit specific, although we've brought out a lot of good nonprofit specific references. I'd love to wrap up with either a prediction or since no one can really predict the future, a hope from everyone on the panel of like, what do you think what do you think is next especially if it's related to the nonprofit space like is there a way you hope people will better adopt tools or a practice you hope people will um will better institute moving forward or just kind of what you see on the horizon um and 
I don't mean to pick on anyone. So anyone who has an answer ready can go first. I'm happy to, to jump in here. Um, so my, mine is twofold. One is that I think that we're going to, particularly in the nonprofit sector, maybe realize the value of some of the quote unquote old school tools that we haven't, that we sort of take it for granted. And what I mean by that is sort of old fashioned phone calls and conference calls. I think we might begin to see those coming back in certain contexts. Um, and then the flip side of that is, I think there's an opportunity in terms of um, AI and automation and so Beth Cantor, who works in the sector, we partner a lot on things. She has a new book coming out about a human-centered approach to AI in the nonprofit sector. And so I think we have an opportunity to make sure as we're leveraging more and more technology in the work that we're doing, how we deliver services, how we connect, um, to make sure that we're keeping the human element front and center so that we are maximizing the efficiencies of technology, but we're also leaving space for people to um, connect and really be human in a very human way, if that makes sense. Definitely. And we'll include a, for everyone, we put out a great recap of this, a blog post. We'll definitely include the link to, to Beth's upcoming uh, book for people to check out too. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll jump on Miko's coattails here and share that uh, both in the nonprofit space, as well as the for-profit space that we embrace the opportunity for more intimacy. And again, not a romantic intimacy, but an intimacy that leads to those deeper levels of trust. And, you know, trust is always talked about as the foundation for all great teams. And, you know, if we're going to do anything great, uh, you know, that, that uh, proverb of, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Uh, clearly, I think most of us uh, are interested in going far and doing great things. Uh, I think most folks who are in the not-for-profit space do so because their heart's pulling them there. Uh, certainly there's a huge attraction there and because it is such a heart centered place that we continue to lean into that, uh, whether we're in a leadership role or at an individual contributor role and recognize that our most precious non-renewable resources time, we spend the majority of it at work. So why would we sort of keep at bay the most unbelievable of our human qualities of compassion and empathy and love and intimacy that drives better work outcomes and adds more happiness to our lives. And, and as technology will undoubtedly continue to increase at a level that we can't keep up with, my hope, and uh, I, I won't say prediction because my future telling capabilities suck, but I hope we embrace and really lean into the best of what we're capable of. And it's those feeling things. And, and that's the unexplored territory that I think the organizations that grab onto it are the ones that are going to get the best talent and drive the best outcomes. I love that. And to add to what Brian is saying on intimacy, I think the reason we have the great resignation is that people feel so disconnected from their work and communities. And so I can't make any predictions for what remote work will look like, but I, some things that I'm seeing trending more positively are the ways in which we communicate and relate to one another, whether that's in writing or video. And so my hope for the future is that we are able to build better ways of building connective tissue between one another, whether that's through organizations or people that we work with, just kind of something more, I think, balanced and holistic, because I think people are craving that deeper sense of just being more holistic in their lives with having their work be a full expression of themselves versus have it be something more separate. Yeah. Christina, I, can you bring us home? <laughs> yeah, I'm like going last. I feel like you all have said it all because, uh, I mean, I was really going to say um, I think people are any, whether you are a nonprofit or for-profit or um, an organization or company's greatest asset. And I think a focus on people uh, is my hope. Um, and one um, that focuses on relationships that allows people to bring their authentic Selves, um, to the workplace, however we are defining that workplace, whether it's in a box or in a physical workspace. workspace um, you know, I think it is through people and through the relationships of teams um, that work gets done, right? And so um, I do think uh, shifting the conversation a little more on the great resignation, I know the headlines are like catchy, and but I think really getting at what's underneath there. Um, because what the pandemic forced us to do is 
uh, it gave us the space time and it just threw everyone off course to think about things in a completely different way. Like what really matters here? What matters? Um, and I think organizations and companies should really be having those conversations and not just go back to whatever strategic plan, you know, you want to dust off from 2020 um, and begin to implement it. I think you got to look at it through a different lens, a lens that it really puts people first, a lens that applies equity to it um, as we all work. Um, because I think it would be a mistake to just go back backwards. Um, I have no idea what comes forward. I think the hardest part of what we're figuring out is we have never done this before. Um, so my hope is also the openness, the continued openness to just like navigate, um, try something and then iterate. Like we don't have, if it doesn't work, it's okay. But, you know, let's, let's figure out how we improve it and continue to iterate. Amazing. Well, thank you so much to all of our speakers today, everyone in the get and the all of our guests. We had a ton of awesome questions, so really appreciate the input. Uh, again, don't forget if you're on Pond or want to join Pond, if you fill out a quick survey, you'll get fifty dollars in your account. So definitely check that out. That'll be on the Pond site on our webinars page as well. You can access there as well as the recording of this if you need to share this with a boss or two. Uh, it's an easy way to let them know. Uh, about some 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 tips they can have about managing your team remotely. Thank you again, everybody.